one, one thing, thing in common. common. You know, they, they knew they, they had, had it in themselves. themselves. They, they knew, knew they, they could, could be something beyond, beyond where they, they were. were. They, they were, were willing, willing to put their time, their energies, to better themselves. themselves. What, what you, you really could really do with, with more skills, it's just, just remarkable. remarkable. So, so I, I would, I would like, like to just tell you a couple of short stories and we'll draw maybe a couple of lessons from them. I would like to tell you of two women that each sold business to Berkshire Hathaway, to Berkshire Hathaway, uh, to, to me, me actually, for many, 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 many millions of dollars. Both of them started with $2,500. By a coincidence, it was the exact same amount. It was everything they had in the world. And, and one, one of them was a woman, woman who landed in Seattle in 1917, couldn't speak a word of English, had a tag around her neck, the tag said, Fort Dodge, Iowa, Iowa the Red, Red Cross. All right, I'm going to be straight up with you. I paid for this ad because I want to give you a free course on how to launch and scale. Come on, guys. I'm sorry. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. I don't know why my YouTube has got me in the wrong account here because we do not do ads around here. These people had one thing in common. You know, they knew they had it in themselves. They knew they could be something beyond where they were. They were willing to put their time, their energies to better themselves. What you really could do with more skills, it's just remarkable. So I, I would like to just tell you a couple of short stories and we'll draw maybe a couple of lessons from them. I would like to tell you of two women that each sold a business to Berkshire Hathaway, uh, to me actually, for many, many, many millions of dollars. Both of them started with $2,500. By a coincidence, it was the exact same amount. It was everything they had in the world. And one of them was a woman who landed in Seattle in 1917, couldn't speak a word of English, had a tag around her neck. The tag said, Fort Dodge, Iowa. The Red Cross got her to Fort Dodge where she was reunited with her husband who had come to the country a couple of years earlier. And she lived in Fort Dodge for two years. And as she put it, she felt like a dummy. She couldn't pick up the language. She couldn't learn a word. And so she decided, she and her husband decided to move to Omaha. They came to Omaha in 1919 and there she found a small colony of Russian Jews so she started feeling more at home and then as her oldest daughter went to school she would come home this daughter Frances and she would teach her mother the words she learned in school that day and this woman Rose Blomkin spent 20 years saving money bringing first her siblings over her mother and father $50 at a time. She sold used clothing to do it. She had four children during this period. And by 1937, after 20 years, she saved $2,500. She went to Chicago and a furniture. Her dream had always been to open a furniture store. And this woman with, I, who had never gone to school one day in her life with $2,500, but with the same spirit that the people in this room had, about having a dream and working to accomplish that dream. She built a business which she <clears throat> sold to me in 1983 for $60 million approximately and which which did a billion and a half dollars worth of business last year. <clears throat> the fourth generation is working in that business. This woman, Rose Blomkin, she worked for me until she was 103. And then she, I'm not, said, then she retired and she died the next year, which is a lesson to all the Berkshire's managers that premature retirement, you, know, not, you can't tell what's going to happen. But Mrs. B, with her $2,500, one further fact about her, she could not read or write. And she went into a furniture business and she didn't bring anything in unique in furniture but she brought, brought a determination to succeed. She knew she could outwork anyone else. She knew she cared about her customers. She worked at very low gross margins, but she built this incredible business. And I saw one other woman 
we did a similar thing with $2,500. I paid her hundreds of millions of dollars for her business. So I decided to go to the source and get these people before. You know, well, I, 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 I don't want you guys coming around to me asking me hundreds of millions of dollars. I'd like to join in with you um, much earlier. So I, I followed this group. And today I'd like to tell you about one other small business person. This person I went to buy his business from him and he turned me down, which was very wise. But this was a fellow who was born about eight years before I was. He was born in 1922. We'll call him Jack, lived in the Midwest. He was a pretty good athlete, didn't like school much. And I'm gonna tell you one thing early in the story. Maybe you can figure out who the guy was. The company he built hires more college graduates each year than any other company in the United States. And this fellow, who was destined for this but did not know it, Jack, went to college for a year and then dropped out. He really wasn't that interested in school. And the year he dropped out was 1941. And when the country became, the United States became under attack, went down to the Army Air Force recruiting station, volunteered, and they turned him down because he had hay fever. So he went over to the Navy and again volunteered and they took him. They put him on an aircraft carrier. He flew small flight airplanes during World War II, got two distinguished flying crosses from the uh, Navy. Uh, and then he came back to the Midwest. So now we've got a young guy Probably by this time he would be 23 or 24 years old. And the interesting thing is, he got back to the Midwest and he actually kind of went from one job to another for a short period of time, or not such a short period of time. And he finally became a used car salesman at a Cadillac dealership uh, in St. Louis, Missouri. And at age 35, having moved up in the organization, the sales organization, he said to his uh, boss, could I go into the car leasing business with you? The boss said, well, if you'll cut your salary in half and you'll come up with, I think it was $25,000, which he borrowed, we can become partners in a car leasing company. So uh, my friend Jack started at age 35 at the car leasing business. And he had seven cars. It was pretty slow. In fact, one of the things he did was whenever the phone rang, he let it ring three or four times so people would think that he was very busy answering other phones. And of course, it was the only call he was gonna get all day. So his first venture was okay, but it wasn't really going to go anyplace. And there's a lesson in this for all of us. At age 40, he decided with 17 vehicles, 17 cars, he was going to go into competition in the rent-a-car uh, business. So now he's taking on Hertz and Avis and National and people like that who have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cars. And he's got 17 cars and his cars aren't any different than theirs. I mean, he's buying them from General Motors or Ford or Chrysler. And uh, he can't get the airport locations. Those companies have them all sold up but he was determined that he would basically offer the customer, he can't offer him a different car, but he can offer him friendlier service than they've ever seen. And so he started the company. He named it after the battleship that he'd flown from in the Pacific, which was the USS Enterprise. And uh, he died about a year, year and a half ago. But when he died, his rent-a-car company, starting with those 17 cars, was worth more than Hertz and Avis and all the rest of the rental cars put together. The man's name was Jack Taylor, and his son, Andy Taylor, is a good friend of mine, uh, runs the business now. A grandchild is in the business. They'll probably be a fourth generation online. So this, this man, in the United States, he didn't invent artificial intelligence. 
You know, he didn't do anything that, uh, just like Mrs. B, selling furniture. I mean, that any one of us could have entered those businesses. But he lived by the, by the creed, basically, of delighting his customers and working with people and establishing the relationship with them so that they in turn would want to delight the customers. He, he couldn't go out there and take care of every rental car uh, possibility, but he, he learned how to project himself uh, and his attitude toward his fellow man and his desire you know, to make a friend out of every customer. He managed to take very ordinary cars and turn them into this extraordinary business from virtually nothing. And, uh, and it illustrates several points. Uh, one is you don't necessarily get it right the first, exactly right the first time. I mean, the car leasing business, you know, basically you were competing on the cost of money to finance cars. And it's very hard to delight a customer when you just give them the car and tell them to send you a monthly check for five years and you'll be back at that time. So. His talents were being wasted, basically, in that business. But at the age of 40, with all of that experience behind him, he found the golden key. He took a very ordinary business and turned it into an absolutely extraordinary operation, just like Mrs. B or Rose Bumpkin did with furniture. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. What's up, everyone? Super excited that you guys are tapped into First Call this morning. Now, you heard from the great legendary Warren Buffett right there about what it takes to become successful. And he gave two incredible stories, right, about two individuals that come from two different walks of life, but there were some underlying principles, there were underlying examples and values that each of these individuals had. And one of the things that they had, and we're gonna talk about it in our book that we've been reading, The Psychology of Money. If you haven't grabbed this book, please grab it. We're reading, we're going through this book in this month, and we're almost a quarter of the way through. It's a quick and easy read, and we only started it this week. And the reason why I want to show you that clip is because the diff, the, the what um, what the enterprise gentleman had and what Miss B had right was one thing that we all can do. And Morgan Housel talked about it real quickly here in this next chapter that we're reading. We're reading chapter five and chapter six, getting wealthy versus staying wealthy. And he says something here at the bottom. Good investing is not necessarily about making good decisions. It's about consistently not screwing up. And that is what these individuals did. They didn't, he didn't choose the right industry right away. You heard him. He was doing car leasing first. He was doing car sales before that. He was in the military before that. He dropped out of college before that. But then he ended up creating one of the largest, if not the largest, rental car company in the world. Because it's not about always making the right decisions, but it's about consistently not screwing up. And in a world today where we're trying to get wealth quickly, in a world today where we see everybody making money fast and we're trying to compare our situations with other people's situations and we're saying like, oh man, there's this 22-year-old millionaire and I'm trying to be a 22-year-old millionaire or I'm already 30 and I had it. Like all these different things that we're doing, I want you guys to understand and put in perspective that some of the greatest businesses, some of the greatest brands, some of the biggest role models and individuals that you look up to, their success was not instantaneous. It did not come just at a snap of a finger. It did not come overnight, but it took some time and it took some developing, it took some growth, and it could, took some going after it and consistency, just like Miss B did. To, and it took some discipline, it took some, so it took some hard work. She, this is a woman who was working until she was 100 years old, right? It took some passion, it took some desire. And for each and every one of us, if we embody those values, if we embody those skill sets, if we embody those things, there's no reason why we cannot accumulate the wealth or achieve the success that we're wanting to have, especially in the financial markets. And we've been learning about that in this book, The Psychology of Money, about ways that we can position ourselves strategically in order to be successful. And we are just taking lessons from history. We're just trying to understand the human mind and how we think about money and how some of the things that we've learned need to be realigned and readjusted and how some of the the 
principles and the tactics that we're blaming other people and we're blaming other situations when really all it is is it comes down to a constructive science that we just need to implement and just a blueprint that we need to execute on. And for each and every one of us, so far in this book, we've read through about four chapters, and we're going to discuss five and six today. But just to give you a, re a quick recap, right? In chapter one, Housel talked about that no one is crazy. And the fact that if you don't know how to create wealth, if you don't know what to do with money, if you just feel like you're not responsible enough with money, or you're not a business owner, you just don't understand some of the plays, it's okay. Why? Because all of us come from different walks of life, and because of that, our our money, our financials, like the way that we view it is all a little bit different as well. The way you think about money can be something as simple as what time you were born in terms of what era. If you were born closer to around the Great Depression, guess what? You're going to look at money a little bit differently and saving money a little different than somebody who was born in a, in a tech boom. Why? Because the marketplace, the economy was different. Somebody who was fresh out of college in 08 and 09, they're going to look at things a little differently than somebody who's graduating college last year. And it's okay that we're not crazy. It's just what do we have to do in order to get to where we're trying to get to? We learned about in Chapter 2 that there's luck and risk involved in this game. And it is a, it's a law. You guys hear me talk about the law of polarity. There's two sides to every coin. So to understand that to get to certain achievements and to reach certain levels and to make certain amounts of money and to get certain wealth, we are going to be required to get lucky at certain points. We are going to need certain breaks to go our way. We're going to need certain opportunities and advantages to work in our favor at times. But then also at the same time, there's a risk factor to everything that we're doing. And if you're too over aggressive, if you're too risky, if you don't know what your risk threshold and your risk tolerance is, then guess what? You're it's not the fact that you were unlucky, you were just over leveraged. You were just overexposed. You put too many eggs in one basket. So because of that, we now need to understand that the best way for us to not get in a place where we're putting all our eggs in one basket, that we're not over leveraged, is to understand that what is enough for us. Like, what is the goal that we're trying to reach? And if we always have this goalpost constantly moving, that's where you get these greedy stories. That's where you get the Bernie Madoffs of the world. That's where you get the individuals who are greedy and scam other people and take advantage of people's situation. And that's what defines all wealthy individuals in your mind here on and so and from now on and, and going forward. No, it's not that wealth is bad. It's not that wealthy people are bad individuals. There are certain individuals who, when they get certain amounts, amounts of money, they do very shysty things and they take advantage of certain people, it's because for them it was never enough, right? And for each and every one of us, we have to decide what is our goalpost, like what is enough for us? What is the thing that we're trying to accomplish and achieve? And when we are able to accomplish that, it's not that we're not going to continue to strive and go after for more. It's just that the fact that is, you know what, we were able to reach this amount and we're not going to jeopardize this in order to get something else that's really unnecessary for us to get to in a certain amount of time frame. If we, it happens over time, if you make $100 million and you're trying to become a billionaire, it's going to happen with time if you just stay as disciplined and consistent as you were before. But it's not something that's worth risking the $100 million or the net worth that, or the hard work that you put in in order to try to get to that billion dollars and jeopardize it all. And when you understand that enough is enough, when you understand what your goalpost is, when you understand what your target is, when you understand that you're not gonna jeopardize certain things in the momentary and in the, in the present to, to harm and hurt what can happen in the future, then you're gonna start thinking about the future a little differently. You're gonna start understanding that the power of compounding is going to be the way that you're gonna be able at the very least to accumulate the wealth that you're trying to achieve. It's gonna take some time. It's going to take some stacking on each other. It's going to take some consistency. It's going to take some reps. It's going to take some years. But if you're willing to stay consistent with it, if you're willing to put in the time, if you understand that the gentleman that we just listened to, Warren Buffett, that, if, that over 98% of his net worth of over $100 billion didn't come until after the age of 50, but he got it started investing at the age of 10. If you understand that he put in 40 years before he reached 
a certain amount of income, a certain amount of net worth, where now that we praise him and that we give him all these accolades and all these, you know, um, we, we, achievements, like where we, 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 we revel in this man and, and the thing that he's been able to do. But do we look at the longevity? Do we look at the time? Do we look at the compounding? Do we look at the deal after deal, the day after day, the book after book, the work after work, the acquisition after acquisition, the merger after merger? No, we don't. But guess what? We see what can happen when we compound. We see what can happen when we put in that time and that effort. And that transitions us into our ch fifth chapter where Housel is talking about getting wealthy versus staying wealthy are two completely different things. Good morning, good morning, good morning to everybody who's tapping in this morning. I see you guys in the chat. Let me just drop a quick good morning here. And you guys know that every Friday um, I like to do some wins. So if you do have a win to share, I'm going to uh, just put the link here right here so if anybody does have a friday win to share feel free to um join the green screen to join the uh the room you don't have to have your camera on you can just press on that link right there just copy and paste that and i can be able to bring you up if you have a win to share and i and i know i kind of just went straight into the psychology of money and kind of dove into that chapter or dive dove into the recap but again if anybody does have a win to share for me my biggest win this week is just we're starting a new month january was a great month i was able to build some consistency in some of the things i'm working on did a lot of game planning strategizing and executing on things so now it's like all right let's roll let's keep the momentum going I've got my team working on a few different things so it's exciting um, you know the progress that we're making the organization that we're having the systems that we're building so that was really big for me in the month of January so that's my biggest win and now my goal is to stay consistent in February and implement a few new things because the truth is the shortest month of the year so if you're not able to really stay consistent in February or this is like the best month to try out something new like if you're trying to go on a fast or if you're not trying to drink for for few for air or you're not trying to, or you're trying to do a new lifestyle change or try to follow a diet february is one of the best months to do that in because it's the shortest month so you might as well just do it for 28 days which is like three weeks three and a half weeks and then get your body used to it and then from there you can keep the momentum going right so that's kind of my biggest win and again if anybody has a win to share you guys know we share wins every friday here on first call so feel free to uh press that link and um would love to see you uh, get there. So chapter five, right? Housel starts off this, sh this chapter with a very interesting story that I kind of want to share with you. So we have two individuals. We have somebody called Jesse Livermore, who was one of the most successful stock market traders of his time. This is back in the 1930s. And by the age of 30 years old, he had almost about a net worth of $100 million if it was inflation adjusted for today. But if you guys understand and study history in October of 1929, then you know that is when that started the big Great Depression. The stock market was hit hard. It was wiped out. They lost a third of their value literally in one day. And Livermore's wife at the time, her name was Dorothy, she feared that Jesse might be doing, might do something bad considering this is where his majority of his net worth was accumulated. This is where a lot of his, you know, time, energy, and focus was diverted to. This is where all his money was invested in. So she was worried, you know, the market crashed on October 29th. We lost a third of the value of the entire market. Like, what is my husband going to do now that he's been exposed to this market at this certain degree of magnitude? Well, guess what? According to this biographer who wrote about Jesse, what, what was the what was the beautiful thing about this time was what before Jesse even knew it, right? Taking some shorts on the market earlier that week. And because the markets had crashed or gone down significantly, this is a man whose net worth went from $100 million and ballooned to $3 billion just at a snap of an instant, literally within a week, right? So during one of the worst months in the history of the stock market, he became one of the richest men in the world. Isn't that a beautiful thing, right? Talk about going against the grain. But now let's look on the other side of the, the spectrum. We have a man named Abraham Jerminsky, right? And he was a multimillionaire real estate developer who had a great fortune in the 1920s as well. This was a great time of economic prosperity in the U.S. Anytime there's a recession, typically before it, there's a serious a time of expansion and a great time of just economic growth. We started in 08, 09, right? The housing crisis was turmoil. That was a catastrophic time for a lot of individuals. But look at how the markets moved from like 2005, 2004 to 2007. Booming. 
going, moving, right? So this gentleman was taking, this real estate investor, Abraham Jerminsky, was taking advantage of this booming market during the 1920s and the economy. So what did he do? He did what probably many of us would have done, bet very heavily on the stock market so this way he can continue to see his wealth grow. But in that same week in October 1929, right, when, uh, when, Livermore became a billionaire, the absolute opposite happened for Jermensky to the point where his wife had to go hire an attorney to go find him because they didn't know where he was, come to find out that he had went and he had taken his life, right? Because of just of him losing his entire wealth and all his net worth and, and losing everything, right? So we had one gentleman become a billionaire, change his life. We had one person lose everything and take his life. So two completely different scenarios for two individuals that participated in the same exact event, right? But now let's fast forward four years later and the stories kind of cross paths again. After the 1929 um, opportunity for Livermore, this man was overflowing with confidence. He's feeling himself. And then probably what any of us would have done again is do what? We make more money and what we start doing. We start taking larger bets. We start sizing up our positions. We start trying to compound this money faster. And what happened was he found himself way over his head. He had increasing amounts of debt. And eventually he lost everything that he had worked for in the stock market literally four to five years later. And then what happened was his wife went to go look for him just like with Jerminsky and come to find out that Livermore ends up taking his life as well. So literally four years later, these two men who had two differing stories, their paths end up aligning and going down the same trajectory. And this is the, this is the reason why that is, because they were both very good at getting wealthy, but they were equally bad at staying wealthy. So that's where for you and I, that's where we, where we are not trying to follow these gentlemen's footsteps. We want to be good at getting wealthy, but we want to be equally as good as what? Staying wealthy. So even if wealthy is not a word that you would apply to yourself, the lessons from that observation apply to anyone at all income levels, no matter where you are right now or where you're trying to get to. Getting money is only one thing. Keeping it is a whole nother thing. And I'm sure many of us understand that and see that, how you have a rich friend who's making all this type of money, but they sometimes ask you for a loan or be like, yo, bro, can you spot me this? Or I just don't have it right now. I'm sure we've run into those situations. Or maybe you've run into situations where, you know, you have your boss who, and you understand that things are going well for them, but then, you know, the company's starting to go under and you're wondering why, because it's just like, well, I thought we were pres prospering. I thought business was booming, right? It's one one thing to be good at making money it's another thing to be good at keeping money and for my people in here who are entrepreneurs for my people in here who are business owners you might not have grown and scale your business to a certain size yet but you know now how to actually make money on your own without having somebody you know without necessarily having somebody give it to you and exchanging it for time right like it was like a regular employee would so because of that while you're focusing on growing your businesses while you're focusing on getting more sales and generating more revenue also be focused focusing on keeping some of that money, investing it back in the business, continuing to allow it to keep growing. So this way, as you're making more, you also can now expand and then keep more, right? But getting money requires taking risks, right? We understand that. Being optimistic, putting yourself out there. But keeping money, that requires the opposite of taking risk. It requires humility. It requires a fear that what you've made can possibly take it, be taken from you, if not just as fast as it is that you built it, and truthfully, quicker. Because well, the way that it typically works is it takes us a, a while to grow, to grow and reach a certain point. Think about your portfolio, for an example, right? Your, your options trading portfolio, your sports betting portfolio, right? It took you a minute to take profit here, take profit there, take profit here, take profit there, and to build up your account to $1,000, $5,000, $10,000, $50,000, whatever your account's at, right? It took you some time to do that. But typically, when you blow your account, how fast does that typically happen? Two, three, four bad trades in a row, wipe out. 50% of your network, 50% of your account. I know I'm not the only person who's experienced this. Two or three bad bets where you oversized, wiped out, 
right? And now you're back where maybe not at square one, but what you worked for for the last two months was unwound and undone in where? Two weeks, two days sometimes. So for each and every one of us, we understand that for us making money, it's going to take some risk. But for us to keep that money, it's going to require some humility. It's going to require some fear and, and some pessimism in the sense of, okay, hold on. There's a chance that this can all be taken from us. And we see this from Michael Moritz, who was the billionaire head of Sequoia Capital. And he had an interview with Charlie Rose. And Charlie Rose was asking him why Sequoia was such a successful business and a money management firm. And Moritz, the billionaire uh, CEO of the company, he said, I think we've always been afraid of going out of business. And Rose was like, really? So it's fear? Only the paranoid survive? And Moritz said something, he said, there's a lot of truth to that. We assume that tomorrow won't be like yesterday. We can't afford to rest on our laurels. We can't be complacent. We can't assume that yesterday's success translate into tomorrow's good fortune. You see what I'm saying? And that's the thing that a lot of us, we miss that ball. When we're talking about creating wealth, when we're talking about generational wealth and investing and taking things to that next level, a lot of us miss that, that just miss that point, right? That for, it's not about being complacent, right? It's not about necessarily resting on your laurels. It's not about not pushing yourself hard enough. It's not trying to take things to the next level. It's not, and I had to learn this. I'm one of those people where, you know, I've been, where I'm, I'm one of those guys where I'm like pushing the envelope. Like, yo, we got to get more sales. We need to be growing the betting account. We need to grow the options, the trading account. Like I'm always about, we're not at where we're at, where we want to be. So we need to be pushing. We need to get that delayed gratification in there. Like I'm like that. But also at the same time, we have to assume that just because we did it yesterday, just because we did it last month, just because we did it last year, we can't be complacent, rest on our laurels, and assume that today, tomorrow, is going to work the exact same for us. And that's why this year I've been preaching to you all, if you're tapping into pre-market prep every day at 8.30 in the morning on Twitter Spaces, about taking profit. Let's, yesterday is a great example, right? So Wednesday, I've been having a killer two, three weeks in the sports betting world, like, Smacking bets. Even in Profit Rocket, I've announced eight or nine straight winners in a row inside the Discord group. I don't know if people are telling it or taking it, but I know I'm putting the winners out there, right? So yet went Tuesday, I had a I had a pretty rough day. Lost. I took a sizable bet on something and it didn't work out in my favor. I thought it was a guaranteed winner and didn't work out, right? And basically at the end of the night, I had lost I like maybe ten percent, right? Five, ten percent. So I, had, I started the day in the green. My first bet hit, but I took two or three bets later on in the night that ended up missing. So now I'm down on the day. So yesterday, I'm like, all right, cool. Let's run it back. We're going to have another killer day. One bad day ain't going to kill you, Noble. But you know what I did before I started the day? I took profit. I withdrew. Right. Even though I'm not like it's not my take profit time. It's not my take. It doesn't fit in my take profit calendar, my schedule. I took profit. Why? Because I've had a killer two, three weeks. I understand the mean reversion is going to be happening at some point. I can't stay as hot as I was. I was eight, hitting on 85% of my bets for the last week and a half, two weeks. That is not going to be sustainable. So because of that, I'm not judging my, I'm not saying that I can't stay consistent. I'm not saying that I'm not going to keep winning, but I have to understand that I need to have a little bit of humility. I have to, it's not about me being complacent. It's just, not, I can't assume yesterday's success is going to translate in today. And you know what happened for me yesterday? I hit my first bet and then I bet a little bit more on my second bet and I lost that bet. So I ended up losing what I made on my first bet and basically breaking even for the day. And I was okay with that. Why? Because I took profit earlier in the day. And that's the beautiful thing. But if I had lost, if I had not taken profit yesterday, I would have had basically two losing days in a row. And that is how you get your account to a certain point where now it's like, oh my goodness, I've just been dwindling day after day. I've been losing day after day. So for us, when we're studying these in, in these legendary investors, when we're reading these books, we can apply these principles in the daily things that we're doing. You don't have to be a millionaire yet to apply this information. You don't need to be an entrepreneur yet to apply this information. You don't have to have the LLC or the business or the genius idea. 
you can apply this business or these ideas in the everyday things that you're doing in the spaces that you're in, even outside of the financial markets, right? You can't assume just because you lost weight yesterday or you went to the gym yesterday that you're going to keep the pounds off today so you can eat whatever the heck you want to eat. The same principles apply. So when we're looking at some of these legendary investors, right, like a Warren Buffett, right? This is a gentleman, Warren Buffett. We always talk about Warren Buffett because he's he's one of the you know legendary money managers. And it's obvious for us to take a look at him and say, okay, this is a man built a hundred billion dollars worth of uh, net worth. He's achieved his investment and returns because he's found the best companies, the cheapest stocks. He's had the best managers. He's been able to pay for the best talent and help that, you know, that that's easy for us to say that, right? That's, but you know, what's the less hard thing for us to do is equally pointing out what he didn't do. So, so many of us, while we're looking for that next great investment, while we're looking for that next great stock or that next great marketplace, and we're looking at people like Warren Buffett and we're trying to emulate them, don't just emulate the things that they did do. Emulate the things that they didn't do, right? For an example, Warren Buffett, he's been investing since he was 10 years old. He's 90-something now, 80 years in the game. He hasn't one time gotten carried away with his debt in the sense of over-leveraging. He hasn't panicked and he didn't sell during the 14 and now at this point 15 recessions that he's lived through. He didn't sully his business reputation. He didn't attach himself to one strategy, one worldview, one way, one passing trend, one thing, narrow focus. Maybe you could say he's focused in terms of value investing. Right. And that's maybe why he missed some of the gains in the tech industry. But overall, it's not like he attached himself to one thing because he owns a conglomerate of companies from insurance to finances to technology, he owns a bunch of different things. Right. He didn't rely on other people's money. He didn't burn himself out and quit or retire. He survived and survival gave him longevity. And that is what we're trying to do. We're trying to have longevity in this marketplace. So we have to survive. So my question to you this morning is what do you have to do to survive? What's the amount that you need to be making on a month to month basis in order to survive? What is it that you need to be able to incorporate into your lifestyle in order to survive? Can you keep going at the pace that you're going with the thoughts that you're thinking in the circles that you're in, running around with the individuals that you are, spending time the way that you are? Can, is that going to give you the longevity that you're looking for? In all honesty, it's so funny to me because when I do like presentations or I talk to like high schoolers and I, and I talk to people younger than me, I always ask them, I'm like, why is it that you want to be a rapper? Like, why is it that you want to get into an industry where the mortality rate is literally like 30 years? Like, I, like there's no industry that I know where people die quicker than in the entertainment business. So why is that the goal of yours? Like, you should be aligning yourself with survival, with longevity from the, st from the onset. And that does not start with just the investment that you're getting into. It starts with your mindset. It starts with the things that are possible. It starts with your lifestyle and how you put all those things together. So when Housel's talking about applying the survival mindset to the real world, it comes down to appreciating three things. The first thing is more than big returns, I want to be financially unbreakable. And if I'm unbreakable, I can actually think I'll get the biggest returns because I'll be able to stick around long enough for compounding to work its wonders. Mm. Mm. That's a beautiful thing right there, right? Like no one wants to hold cash during a bull market. That, that, that's obvious, right? You want your assets to go up, to take advantage of the marketplace that it's in, right? But this is, but this is the thing, right? Do you have the ability to be unbreakable, right? And not unbreakable from the sense of I've grown my portfolio to a size where I'm necessarily untouchable, but to a point where I'm willing to be consistent enough. I'm willing to show up enough. I'm willing to keep contributing to this account consistently, daily, weekly, monthly, however, you, right? So this way now you're using the compound effect and it's the multiples of the 1%. Growing on 1%, growing on 1%, the 2%, the 5%, the 5%. It's that multiples, right? That's now going to allow you to prevent that one desperate ill-timed stock sale that can destroy you. 
or getting into this marketplace or this industry that you know nothing about that's blowing your entire net worth, right? Or that's going to lose all the money. Compounding doesn't rely on earning big returns. It's merely good returns sustained uninterrupted for the longest period of time, especially in times of chaos and havoc, which will always win. Right now, it's a beautiful thing. I'm seeing what's playing out in the economy, and I've been praying for this. I've been praying for this. I'm not going to lie to you. Back in 2020, I missed what happened during COVID. I'm not, I, I saw the writing on the wall, but I missed the opportunity. And I missed the pullback, that recessionary period, and the short boom that came thereafter. The bear market that we experienced last year and the recessionary environment that we're currently in, that's only going to get a little bit worse. I'm not trying to put fear or panic into anybody. The, F, the Fed, you know, they, they gave us some, they didn't give us positive news this week. So I'm not sure why the stock market's been running the way that it is. But he's basically just trying not to lose at this point. He's holding the ball in the third quarter, right? And all I'm saying is, if you are looking for an opportunity it's during times of economic contraction that you should be focusing on expanding, that you should be for looking forward to push forward. Housel just said it here, especially in times of chaos and havoc. You, and if you're staying consistent, if you're staying uninterrupted, I guarantee you what you're going to be able to do is be able to get through that. Not only get through that tough time, but your returns on the other side of that because you stayed consistent, because you didn't fall off. Is going to be right there. That's the longevity. That's the survival that we're talking about, right? Is this making sense to some people? I see you guys here. I see you guys in the room. I see some eyes here. If this is making sense so far, just drop, just drop something in the chat for me. Let me make sure you guys are here with me. Just as I see you, uh, Big Beer, saying that's true. Now let, let me just see something. Like if, if this is making sense, right? If you guys are following me, the second thing that ha that House was talking about in terms of the survival mindset is not just being financially unbreakable and the compounding effect that can come from that. But it's planning is important, but the most important part of every plan is to plan on the plan, not a going according to plan. Okay, I see you, Big Beard. I see you, Big Beard. I'm, I'm glad you're with me, right? So a plan is only useful if it can survive reality. And a future filled with unknowns is everyone's reality. I'm just here to let you know that. When I, I wrote, I'll never forget, I was younger, we were at some church event, we were on the beach, and we had to fill out a little time, um, you know when you put the genie in the bottle, like the little writing on the sheet? I told myself I was going to be a millionaire by 30. I wrote that on that sheet, I was going to be a millionaire by 30, I was going to be a billionaire by the time I was like 35. I had no type of clue at the time what it was going to take to make a million dollars, and no clue. I, I wrote this when I was like 10 years old, 12 years old, 15 years old. And I'm 27 now, so I'm getting close to that time where I have to cash in on this, right? But this is the one thing that I need you to understand. I thought I was going to go to college and I was going to come out making X, Y, and Z because I was going to be working at a stock brokerage firm. I thought I was going to be making enough money at this point to do retire my mom or whatever. What did the case may be like? And I'm sure you guys have stories like this as well. Understand this one thing. Planning is important. You always hear me talk about putting, out, putting together the plan, writing the blueprint, putting the script together. But the most important part of every plan is understanding that the plan is not always going to go according to plan. And this is somebody that me, I like to control things. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not a control freak. I've been accused of it at times, but I don't think I'm a control freak. But I do like to plan stuff out, and I don't like things when things don't go according to the plan, or at least we didn't discuss an, all, an audible or an alternative option. But one thing that I've learned as I've grown up through life is that not everything can go according to plan. So because the future is uncertain, you have to understand that's your reality. And because that's where your reality, you now must have to put certain things to survive these unexpected times, these contingencies. And that's why you'll never hear me speak against an emergency fund. Now, I'm not a big fan of Dave Ramsey and some of the things that he teaches, but the emergency fund makes sense. Why? Because of the plan. You can't you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if a car is going to break down. You know if someone's going to get sick and you might need something to fall back on. I agree with that. So because of that, right? The more you need specific elements of a plan to be true, the more fragile your financial life becomes. Understand that. Like the more you need this 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 to happen, the more fragile your financial life becomes. So think about it this way. Sports betting Everybody and their mama loves what? 
parlays, right? But I hate parlays because you need one, two, three, four, five games to all hit for you to make your money. The more variables that you have that you cannot control or that's on the input, it's going to affect the output. Understand that. And the more fragile it's going to get or the harder it's going to become for you to win. That's why parlays pay out the payout that they do. So think about the same way. The further outside the money that you are, guess what? The more elements that you need to work in your favor so this way you can actually break even on that contract or actually finish in the money. So that means it makes it harder for you to, for, for what? That contract to expire worth something rather than expire worthless. You see how this works? So the more things that you have on your plan and your blueprint and your script and you're like, I need all of this to work, the harder it's going to become. Simplify it down. And as you do it as simply as this, a frugal budget, flexible thinking, and a loose timeline, anything that lives will let, uh, anything that lets you live happily with a range of outcomes. Just put that together. That's what Housel says. A frugal budget, flexible thinking, and a loose timeline. And anything that, li that lets you live happily within those range, guess what? You're going to be good to go. You're going to be good to go. And as we are now trying to, 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 to get, I appreciate you, Heat Pumps. I like it. I like it. I appreciate y'all. I see y'all in the chat. I appreciate you guys, right? Getting, getting the energy going this morning. It's good to see you, Durag, this morning. It's good to see you, Moyo. It's good to see you, Will the Beast. It's good to see you guys, right? And that's, a, that, that's all we're trying to do It's just remain flexible. And, and for us, survival is about being flexible. It's about like when you put an animal in the jungle, that they, they, they have to contend with the weather. They got to contend with other predators. They got to contend with humans as a predator or a captor. They got to deal with natural elements. They got to deal with actually hunting their food, finding a place to sleep. Like there's so many different things. And understand that for us at our primal state, we have to get back to that point where now we're trying to not only survive, but we're putting certain things into place. So now we have that survival mindset. Now the third thing, our barbell personality. Optimistic about the future, but paranoid about what will prevent you from getting to the future is vital. A barbell personality. So you guys know what a barbell strategy is for my people who are in the stock market, right? You got one side, one side, the heavy, and then, you know, the bell, the, the bar in the middle, right? That's it. Optimistic about the future, but paranoid about what will prevent you from the future. And then you got everything there in the middle that's going to drive you to get there. And the reason why we do that is because I want to share my screen real quick. I want, to show, I want to show you guys this, right? Look at this chart right here, right? You guys can see like my sports is pulled up there, right? You could look at this chart right here, right? He, he shared this inside of um, the chapter. And the reason why that, that chart is important for you to see is because look at this. 1985 to 2010, real GDP over time has just only done what? It's only gone up. So if we are willing to stay consistent, if we're willing to put not rest on our laurels, if we're willing to be optimistic about the future, but be pessimistic about losing everything, right? Then guess what? We have the ability to get to where we're trying to get to with time. Optimism is usually defined as a belief that things will go well, right? But that's incomplete. Sensible optimism is a belief that the odds are in your favor and over time things will balance out to a good outcome even if what happens in between is filled with misery. And this is one thing that you know like I know. We, there's going to be misery. There's going to be down times. There's going to be hurt. There's going to be pain. There's going to be setbacks. But we understand that if we're willing to make it through the times, that one chart that I just showed you from 18, 1850 to 2010, you want all, all the things that you endured? We've lost over millions of Americans, three to four million Americans fighting nine major wars. 99.9% .9 of businesses went out of business from that time frame. Four presidents were assassinated. We've had over 30 separate natural disasters killing at least 400 Americans in each of those disasters. We've had 33 re recessions last an accumulative of 48 years, right? We've had the stock market has fallen from 10% from their recent highs at least 100 plus 
times. Stocks have lost a third of their value over 10 times. Annual inflation has exceeded 7% at least 20 different years. Listen, there's always going to be another setback. There's always going to be another obstacle. There's always going to be another thing that can push us against the wall. There's going to be another thing that drives us to quit. But look at that chart right there. Are you willing to stay sustainable over time? Are you willing to stay consistent over time? Because for us, everybody here was probably born at 197 or earlier. So from here to here, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. And that's just real GDP. That's not even talking about the individual assets like how the stock market is performed in that time or the real estate market is performed in that time or somebody who's maybe able to pivot between different industries or businesses at that time right we can all do this stuff my friends right and you know i know i spent a good amount of time on chapter five and, and i, I got to go uh, through chapter six real quickly but the reason why you know the reason why i spent a lot of time on chapter five is because we got to understand that survival tactic first before we're able to kind of understand chapter six. And chapter six, he titles this chapter, Tales You Win. And it's a simple, you can be wrong half the time and still make a fortune. As simple as that, right? And he uses an example of this art dealer who moved to the America, to America named Heis Bergen, Berg, Berg, I can never say these guys' names, Bergernan, and they flew, and he left Nazi Germany in 1930s. By the 1990s, he had a huge art collection, right? And he donated, um, several pieces to uh, the German government for 100 million euros. The private collection value of that, of what he donated, was over a billion dollars. But this is the beautiful thing. Over 99% of the art that Bergenin had was, was worthless, or it wasn't worth a lot of money, or it was worth a few thousands of dollars. But guess what? The, the few pieces that he had of Picasso or Matisse were worth hundreds of millions of dollars so i'm here to let you guys understand that if you want if i'm going to give you a quick calculus lesson you got the bell curve right um i can pull it up real quick if you guys need to see in a an example um the bell curve is this, this thing of standard deviation right so let's pull this up real quick so we got the bell curve right here right i hopefully you guys can see that uh pretty simply right the bell curve theory right on the two ends we have the tails here in the middle is where we have the events that will most likely occur, right? Here on the ends are the outlier events. And I'm here to get you guys to understand and know what drives the markets, what drives success, what allows you to call people skilled, what allows you to call people lucky is not the big thing in the middle, but it's the belt, it's the, the long tails on each side of the standard deviation curve, right? So gotta understand that it was 98, 99% of Burgeoning's portfolio was basically worthless, break even, worth a few thousand dollars. But it was the ends, it was the tail ends, the Picasso painting over here, the Matisse over here, the Van Gogh over here, that were worth hundreds of millions of dollars that would offset all the other things that he had in the middle. So when we think about success, when we think about life, when we think about some of the things that we're achieving, right, in business and investing, it works a very similar way. The long tails, the furthest ends of a distribution of outcomes, have tremendous influence in finance where a small number of events account for a majority of the outcomes, right? So growing a company to the size of Amazon when 99.9% .9 or percent of businesses in the last 150 years have failed is a tail event. So next time you're trying to compare yourself to Jeff Bezos and the company that he's created, understand that that's a tail event, okay? Somebody who's been able to go 100% or 100,000%, let's just say, or 1,500,000, or maybe I've, the biggest trade I've ever seen from an options trading standpoint, I've seen somebody do like 20,000% on a trade before, right? Understand that is a tail event. 85% of options expire worthless. So for somebody to get a, a contract that has moved to the point that he was able to get even a 1,000%, a 1,500%, or in this case, a 20,000% winner, that's on the tail end of the curve. So for many of us, we got to understand 
that it's only one event that we need. It's only one breakthrough. It's only one opportunity. It's only one marketplace because that's what drives the market. We saw that with Walt Disney. This was a company that was bankrupt right in the 1930s and the 1940s this was a company that was losing employees that was that was it was so expensive to make these cartoons but it wasn't until they made snow white in the seven doors that then what happened it pushed them to the point where they were extremely profitable because it was that one event so anything that is huge profitable famous or influential is the result of a tail event an outlier one in thousands or millions events Right. And most of our attention goes to those things, rightfully so. Right. Because it was huge. But when most of what we pay attention to is the result of a tale, it's easy to underestimate how rare and powerful they are. So I want you guys to understand that when you're only focusing on the outlier events, you start setting a standard for yourself that's truthfully unrealistic because you're setting the bar against an unrealistic event about an event that's such an outlier, that's something that's going to happen once in a lifetime or once in a few opportunities. And I'm not saying that your tail event is not coming. And I'm not saying that you don't have a tail event in you. We all do. We all can perform things and, and, and defeat the odds. But when we're trying to focus on building wealth, when we're trying to focus on how we're going to get to that next level, we got to understand that that a majority of companies that go public on the stock market, bro, they lose value. They, 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 they end up getting delisted with several, in a, several years. Two and a half percent of investments, right? They only make about 10K or not 10K, 10X return. So when you're trying to get 10X every day, understand that that's not that normal, right? Understand that 40% of all Russell 3000 stock components lost at least 70% of their value since 1980. Understand that, okay? And these are companies that are publicly traded. So for effectively for all of us, what we need to be looking at, right, is when we're thinking about investing and when we're thinking about a recession, just this is the last example I want you guys to think about, is what he gave the example with Sue, Tim, and Tom. So we have three individuals. So let's consider what happened if you invested $1 a month from every, from every month, just $1, from 1900 to 2019. So or that, cause that's when this book was written. Or let's just say from now, okay? That's, let's just say that person who did that from 1900 to 2019, $1 a month, that was Sue, okay? So, and maybe investing during recession, like that's scary. I understand that. So let's just say you invest your dollar in the stock market when the economy is not in recession and you sell everything when it's in a recession and you save your monthly dollar in cash, okay? So you invest your dollars in the stock market when times are good. You'd sell when there's a recession and you save that dollar in cash and you invest everything back in the stock market when you get past that recession, okay? Let's call that investor Jim. So Sue is investing a dollar a month every time. Jim is only investing in times of in economic contraction, I mean, in ex economic expansion and growth, okay? And then Tom, he's, he's gonna take a few months off, right? When there's a, when there's a recession. So he invests $1 in stocks when there's no recession, but he sells six months after recession begins and invests back after six months of the recession ends. So he gives him some buffer period before he dies back in. He wants to see a trend. He wants to see momentum first, okay? So we've got Tom, Jim, and Sue. Do you know how much money these individuals would have over the course of over three? All, th all three, they follow the same thing, same exact time period, 1929, right? Tim... And Tom, excuse me, who only invests when times are good and he sits on the sideline and waits for a certain trend to identify, he's going to be making about $230,000, right, at the end of this example. Tim, who only invests during times where they go up and he stays on the fence when times are going down, he's going to have about $250,000, $260,000. But Sue, on the other hand, by the time she's done, she invested consistently month after month, never took off good times or bad times. She will have $430,000 in that account. 
So the thing is, there were 1,400 months that all these individuals invested in, right? Just over 300 of them, based off of historic numbers, were in a recession, okay? But by keeping her cool during the 22% of the time when we were in a recession and the economy was in a bad place or people were losing jobs or there was a layoffs or, you know, there was high inflation, Sue ends up making almost three quarters more money than Jim or Tom. And that is the difference between playing the tail events and playing just the regular standard deviation in the middle. Right. Jeff Bezos says something when, you know, when he came out with the fire phone, he says, if you think that it's a big failure and we're work, we're working on much bigger failures right now. I'm not kidding. Right. Just what for he said on the blip of things in Amazon, the fire phone or whatever, when they try to drop that it was just going to be one little mistake, one little failure. So for each and every one of us, we're getting caught up on the failures. We're getting caught up on the things that are setting us back. We're getting set up, caught up on, hey, I need to find that one investment. I need to find that one stock. I need to get into NFTs. I need to get into crypto. I need to get into sports betting. I need to get into stocks. I need to get into real estate. It's not about that. It's about being consistent, putting that money to the side, putting it to the marketplace, injecting it, consistent, month after month, day after day. During economic downturns, you still keep going forward. During times when it's not good, you keep going forward. When it's times are booming, you keep that same level of discipline. You don't over leverage. You don't go put all your eggs in one basket. You keep pushing forward because the tails are going to rescue us. We understand that the outlier events, like in 2020, when you could buy any stock and it was going to go through the roof and you could and, and you could just buy calls out the whim and it's just going to make you money. That was the tail event of the stock market. Right. That was going to be the thing that was going to rescue you. Right. When more when when Lehman Brothers and Goldman Sachs was going down in the and Morgan Stanley, in the OA financial crisis, the injection of capital, the stimulus money that the banks gave um, to to them. Guess what? That is the tail event. There's always going to be a tail event that's going to come to the rescue. So while Amazon's Fire Phone might not work, guess what? Their cloud servicing was the tail. While your first business night might, might not work, then it might be your other business that's going to work. While your first investment might not work out in your favor, guess what? It's going to be that tail event, that one stock that gives you a thousand percent winner that's going to keep you going. And that's why you got to keep showing up. That's why you got to keep pushing yourself. I know I'm past seven. I'm about to let y'all go. But I just had to make sure you guys understood this because for some of us, we're getting so caught up and we're wondering when our breakthroughs come and we're wondering when we're going to get lucky. When is it our going to be our chance? And I'm just here to let you understand that your tail event is coming, but you got to be willing to stay consistent. You got to be putting in the time in the bell curve. You got to have the averages in the middle. So this when the outlier event comes, it's there to rescue you. It's there to save you. It's there to propel you. It's there to push you. It's there to elevate you. And it's the last thing I'll leave. It's a great quote by George, George Soros, right? It's not whether you're right or wrong. That's important. But how much money you make when you're right and how much money you lose when you're wrong. You can be wrong half the time and still make a fortune. So I'm here to guys let you understand this one thing, right? You can be wrong. You can fail. It's okay. Because even if you are wrong, even if you flip that coin, you have a 50% chance of hitting. You have a 50% chance of winning. And for each and every one of us, as long as you keep moving forward, as long as you keep staying consistent, as long as you keep giving $100, $50, $10 to that options account, to, 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 to that long-term portfolio, to buying one extra stock a week, one extra stock, stock a month, you, it's all about just mitigating that risk. Don't focus on how much you're making. Don't focus on how much you're losing. Focus on how much skin you have in the game because you can be wrong 50% of the time and it's just going to require that one tail event. It's just going to tire that consistency enough times that you're going to be able to be on the other side of it, guys. And I'm super excited that you are showing up every single day and you are headed towards your tail event. You're headed towards the right side of the victory that you're going to accomplish. And the beautiful thing about the standard deviation is this. As you, the average, the bell curve, right? The more you get used to certain things, the more it becomes average for you. So the more that you're used to making $1,000 a day or $1,000 a week, it becomes average for you. So the tail event now is going to be a $10,000 win. 
or a hundred thousand dollar win. You see how that works? So as you just continue to stay consistent, there was a time when I remember the first time where I sold something and I made a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars when I was flipping shoes back in college. That felt good. That was a tail event because at the time everybody the the standard deviation was everybody was broke in college, right? Then now a tail event is not a hundred dollars anymore for me. It's not two hundred dollars anymore for me. Now that is below average, right? Now it's how can you do ten thousand dollars in a day? How can you do ten thousand dollars in a month? That's now the tail event. That's now the average. And as you guys keep pushing forward, your averages are going to continue to move. So just keep going after it, keep staying consistent, and keep pushing yourself, and let's keep getting to that next level. We're going to be reading chapter six and or seven and eight, excuse me, over the weekend. Chapter seven is titled Freedom. Controlling your time is the highest dividend money pays. That's a beautiful thing to, to, real, to, to notice and to know. And we're going to be reading chapters in 7 and 8 on Monday. So on Twitter Spaces, we will be back. I appreciate you this morning. I appreciate you, Big Beard. I appreciate you, um, 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 Age of Hyperon, right? And I, this is a great question. I think this is the question that you guys can journal about this weekend. Or we'll leave it on here. What is your tail event, right? Big Beard said it first. What is your tail event? For Luz, it might have been grabbing that, that investment banking job that she's been working so hard to grab over the last year or two. And now that she's gotten it, guess what? It's going to be standard for her now. Now it's going to be what's the next thing. For each and every one of us, we, can, we might not know what our tail event is because it's hard to predict it. It's hard to plan it. It's a one in an outside outlier chance of it happening. But what is it that we're going for? I know this. The billionaire that I'm going to become, the billionaire that you're going to become, that's going to be a tail event. Why? Because there's only about 3,000 billionaires in the world out of 7 plus billion people. And then when you think about that, less than 200 of those are black of the 3,000. That lets you understand that we are a tail, tail, tail event. So keep that in mind that when you're working towards certain things, that what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to achieve is already on the outside of the standard deviation that you're used to. The fact that you made it out of the hood, that was your tail event. The fact that you made it, you know, when everybody else in your family doesn't have financial literacy and you're financially illiterate, that's your tail event. The fact that you own a home when everybody else is renting, that's your tail event. The fact that you know about the stock market when everybody else doesn't know about it, that's your tail event. The fact that you know how to make your own money when everybody else has to show up and get paid in terms of working for somebody else to get their own money, that's your tail event. It's okay. Your tail event's going to continue. Gut, gut, it's going to keep moving. It's going to keep going. We're just going to continue to figure out ways to expand our standard deviation, stand our bell curve, because the more we extend, guess what? The wider reach we have, the bigger our averages become, and then the wider our tail event happens. So when something out here happens, it's going to be so significant that it's going to be life-changing. It's going to be revolutionary. And for each and every one of us, we're working towards those little revolutionary events. But understand, the only way we're going to get there is if we have the willingness to fail, if we have the willingness to stay humble, stay consistent. Be optimistic about the future, but be pessimistic about the fact of everything that you that you've done to get you to this point that you have the potential and the chance to lose it all and that's not fear to hold you back but it's a fear to keep in your mind so this way it's going to propel you to keep moving forward i appreciate you guys for tapping into first call today appreciate this space appreciate every single one of you all always for the support in the community as we continue to grow and continue to push ourselves to get to that next level i'll see you guys on uh 8 30 a.m eastern standard time on twitter spaces for mindset fridays we're gonna get that space jumping this morning and really you know take things to the next level i appreciate y'all and let's get after it today and dictate your fate later